other participants who would like to ask questions. I saw a hand by Tinashe Nyamunda who's joining us from South Africa. I also saw another hand by Riziki Dustan who is joining us from Kenya. So I'm just going to give, uh, firstly, I'm going to give uh, Tinashe Nyamunda the time to ask and then immediately afterwards, uh, Riziki Dustan, you can ask your question and then you can respond to both the questions, uh, Mr. Pia. So Mr. Mr. Nyamunda, this is your time. Uh, thank you, Anotida. Um, and thank you for, well, I joined a bit late, so I had the tail end of the presentation, I suppose. Uh, so I hope my question won't be an unfair one uh, on you, peers. But at what point does a crisis become a crisis? And at what point does it end? Uh, I'm asking this question because there's this whole discourse about the Zimbabwe crisis whether it's political, economic, or otherwise, and how we can resolve that crisis um, for whatever other alternative there may be. My look at Zimbabwean history is that however we define a crisis, there seems to be crisis after crisis, whether it's a crisis during Smith's time because of the palace school, whether it's the crisis under UDI, the liberation struggle, the crisis under Bukura Hundi, uh, the crisis in the 1990s, the crisis after land reform, the crisis following the coup. So my question is, if these kinds of problems are perennial, can we still define them as a crisis? If not, then what is it? Wonderful. Thank you very much for that, uh, Mr. Nyamunda. So, Mr. Riziki Dustan, you can you can get in now. This is your time. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chikumbu and uh, Peers, for your great contribution. Actually, my thoughts have followed the, the conversation by Dr. Peers, and I really love his great insights about uh, Zimbabwe as a whole and probably the solutions to the Zimbabwean crisis. I'll put probably three or two questions. One is about which kind of uh, democratic approach or a diplomatic approach will um, South Africa, for example, being a, a big brother in the region or a big sister in the region, in the Sadiq region, offer to the Zimbabwean people without necessarily <coughs> with their, with their <coughs> sovereignty as such. So, because all approaches that probably South Africa will offer towards the Zimbabwean crisis, there is a way that it changes to interfering with their sovereignty as a nation. And uh, as such, then uh, a lot is bound to be lost in terms of uh, the sovereignty of a country vis-a-vis -vis the place of a crisis that probably Zimbabwe has found itself in. I've also read uh, widely about Zimbabwe and uh, and uh, my thought probably will be that um, why can't Zimbabwe, on the other hand, also spearhead the removal of sanctions, spearhead removal of sanctions from the EU, from the from from the EU, from America, and other other key trading blocks, so that uh, the people of Zimbabwe and their leaders will be in a way be allowed to you know have a visit to those key areas or those states or those regional blocks with a view of also opening up their trading uh, market. So if, for example, the EU or the, the AU uh, spoke in unison that, um, that uh, you know, we have to really come out strongly and uh, fight for the liberation and the removal of the economic sanctions from Zimbabwe, then we'll be better placed than uh, just interfering with the, uh, with, the, with, the, with the operations. Create an, a working environment for Zimbabwe, then all other factors will be really taken care of. Then uh, I don't know how this can, be, can work, but um, the opposition, majority of the Zimbabwean as uh, Paris has really explained, majority of the elites have moved to either South Africa or to Europe. Chikumbu might, might be one of them. <laughs> of, course, of course, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so why can't we promote dialogue between the opposition and probably this is where uh, international crisis group should really help us and most, mostly those probably best in South Africa. Why can't we promote uh, dialogue 
between the opposition and uh, and the government, uh, more so within the ZANU PF and the key opposition parties, also trying in a way to stop or uh, reduce the disagreement within ZANU, P ZANU PF and promotion of uh, what I could call uh, key democratic uh, principles within within ZANU PF to be able to tear of uh, the 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 divergence of opinion with a view of strengthening the democratic uh, democratic uh, institutions both within ZANU PF and within uh, within uh, the government of Zimbabwe so i'll think probably if players can be able to handle more so how best which democratic which which, which diplomatic approach will be best is it uh, basically the quiet diplomacy or a proactive kind of diplomacy? Then how best can South Africa, for example, being a big brother, be able to really iron out the issues of um, disagreements within Zanu PF and within the political space in uh, South in uh, Zimbabwe? If we can be able to achieve that, and South Africa goes ahead to either lobby the EU lobby, the European Union, uh, the, uh, the America lobby, other uh, other countries to remove the sanctions. Then the people or the ma the majority poor of South Africa of uh, Zimbabwe will benefit from uh, the, the the kind of uh, approach that South Africa will take. Wonderful. Thank you very much for those questions, uh, Mr. Tinashe Nyamunda and Mr. Riziki Dustan, uh, Mr. Piers. This is your time you can respond and then I can take another batch of questions. Sure, thanks. And um, so let me deal with those in order. And Tanasha, thanks very much for, for, for the question, uh, which is certainly uh, not an unfair one. I mean, I think in many respects, as we saw last year, uh, in relation to the visit uh, from the South Africans to Harare, it, it, there was a sort of semantic debate about the issue of crisis. Uh, is it a crisis or is it a challenge uh, that is, or are there challenges that are being faced? I mean, I think, you know, we have to be very careful at the International Crisis Group with that uh, word in, in, in the name of the organization. And, and it's something that uh, I'm sure won't surprise you that periodically over the years, myself and colleagues are often accused of generating or portraying situations as crisis for some kind of job creation scheme uh, for, for, for ourselves. And we are very conscious about hyperbole in, 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 in these situations. I mean, for goodness, how long have we been hearing from certain people that Zimbabwe is on the edge of a precipice, that it's about to collapse into uh, absolute chaos? Uh, and I think, you know, the fact that this, this uh, hasn't happened in some respects uh, then uh, reinforces a... a contrary position is, of course, there is no crisis. This is a manufactured uh, reflection of reality uh, with a political agenda behind it around regime change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I think in some respects, both of these positions, uh, these polarized positions reflect a fundamental failure to have an honest discussion about the actual situation on the ground. And, and, and I think, uh, you know, this whether one then interprets particular issues as a crisis or not, okay, is open to interpretation. If you have seven and a half million people food insecure in a country that was once a major exporter of food uh, and, and didn't really have domestic uh, food problems, does that represent a crisis in that sector? Does massive informalization of the economy represent a crisis? Does multiple human rights violations uh, and a culture of impunity represent a crisis. Again, you can go through all the different sectors and you can, and you can have discussions about these issues. Whether or not they combine to create a crisis, of course, uh, uh, is, is, is open to debate. But I, I certainly hear what you're saying about how the issue then gets manipulated uh, one way or the other, which I think diverts us from having this more open and honest conversation which is essentially what we are trying to encourage South Africa to help enable. It's not, uh, 
you know, it, it all, you know, this is something which which is pertinent to South Africa itself. I mean, in, internally, you know, with our domestic politics, and this is something we didn't talk about, and in, in, I didn't talk about in the presentation or haven't responded to the extent to which the domestic dynamics in 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 South Africa constrain uh, its ability to 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 look outside and engage on these issues, as is expected by many people. Uh, uh, and and you know the extent to which some of the internal dynamics inside South Africa play out in to, in, in, in in relation to how it wants to address the situation in Zimbabwe as well. Uh, I think you know we shouldn't get lost. We know that there are some serious serious problems in Zimbabwe. Again, whether we call it a crisis or not, uh, uh, you know, is 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 up for debate. Uh, so that 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 for me is is a kind of starting point on that. But I do I do take what you've said to Nashi in uh, you know with uh, uh, I think it's an important issue to keep on the table. We shouldn't always be going for the dramatic uh, for the for, for for the key headline because it loses uh, uh, its import, uh, loses its uh, potency uh, and 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 credibility. Uh, it's the it's the whole. Uh, uh, chicken licking sky is going to fall in our head story uh, that eventually people stop listening. But we have seen a widespread deterioration on multiple indicators uh, over the last few years.